There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free. And things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country, and there is no escaping it, no matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Hello and welcome. You're tuned into a brand new week of the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness on a Supernatural News Parish Share Monday. I'm your host, Dave Schrader, along with me, the ever luxurious looking Mr. Tim Dennis. Hi, Tim. Hi. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, we've got a, a short week here for our audience. So I wanted to uh, just start off the show by mentioning that we will be on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and of course, we'll also be offering True Crime Tuesday this week, but we're going to take Thursday and Friday off this week, Tim. We deserve it. We need a little break. It's a nice holiday, time to spend with our family and friends, and now that I'm a freshly married man, I need a little bit more time with my wife. So we're going to go up to the Palmer House right after Thanksgiving dinner and uh, spend the weekend up there ghost hunting, hanging out, and I'll be hosting Coast to Coast this Saturday night. How about that? Sounds like a plan. I'll be up there as well on Saturday. Excellent. Yes, you'll be there joining me as we host Coast to Coast AM, and we've got uh, got a lot of cool stuff we're going to be covering tomorrow. Uh, speaking of cool stuff, Tim, the uh, the show we've got for True Crime Tuesday, I'm very excited about. I, You know, I... I, I I get twitchy this time of year. My birthday shares the same unfortunate date as the assassination of John Kennedy, right? He was assassinated Mm -hmm. in, what, 63? I was Mm -hmm. born in 67. We've heard so many different takes and angles on the story, but I've got a really interesting story to share, a totally different story to share surrounding the uh, Kennedy assassination. And it's about the mysterious death of a world-famous reporter, that may have been onto something. A little mm. too much information. That's tomorrow, the reporter who knew too much on True Crime Tuesday. Remember, you can go subscribe just by going to darknessradio.com. Click on that True Crime Tuesday banner. You just have a few days left. Remember, we're going to draw names on my birthday, Wednesday. On my birthday, we're going to draw three names that will win a one year paid subscription to True Crime Tuesday. Everybody that signed up by my birthday will automatically be entered into that drawing. So make sure if you're on the fence post and you're thinking about joining, this is a great time to do it. It's only 5 bucks a month, and you can quit any time. You're not contractually locked in for a year or even six months. You can go month by month. And when you subscribe, it gives you access to all of our past episodes and gives you access to the episodes any day of the week. It's True Crime Tuesday. But, Tim, when the Tuesday comes and a brand-new episode drops, did you know that people could wait till Wednesday, maybe even Thursday? Some even say Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, or even occasionally on a Monday, just to listen to the last True Crime Tuesday. Well, why would you do that, though? Well, you know what, Tim? Sometimes you just want to spread them out a little bit. You want to you want to savor them like a, a tasty nougat. You just want to let it melt in your <laughs> mouth. So you can subscribe. It's five bucks a month. That gets you four to five. 90 to 120 minute episodes. Guys, go sign up for it. Stop pussyfooting around. Stop waiting. It's great. You love what you hear on our show, Beyond the Darkness. Well, if you love what you hear on Beyond the Darkness, you're going to love what you hear on True Crime Tuesday. Tim and I bring our simple tastes and interests to the strange and the macabre and, and the twisted crimes from around the world. And it's a great show. We get a lot of fantastic feedback, not only from the listeners that have subscribed, but from the authors, researchers, investigators, and survivors who tell their tales with us on that show. So come on, give it a listen, try it out. Again, just give it a shot for one month. But if you sign up between now and November 22nd, my birthday, you're automatically entered into that drawing for a one-year paid subscription. Tim, let's get launched into the world of Supernatural News, shall we? All right. All right. Let's start off where we haven't been for a while, Tim. Florida? No, not that or the dentist. We're going to go to Loch Ness. 
Are you ready? All right. Sightings of the Loch Ness Monster are at the highest this century after a nine-year-old boy who came to Scotland, especially to see Nessie, did just that. How about that? You set a goal? Bam. Accomplished. Genetics expert Dr. Joe Knight, a lecturer at Lancaster University, was uh, staggered to see an unexplained strange fin shape when looking through her and uh, her and son Sam's holiday snaps. The family took a break at Loch Ness on November 2nd after Sam wanted to go monster hunting and even took his own ropes and genetic sampling kit. The Knights went on a tourist cruise of the Loch and took hundreds of photographs. It was only when we looked at them afterwards that we saw what appears to be a very dark shape somewhere in the Urquhart Bay, a very favorite haunt of Nessie, said Dr. Knight, age 44. I don't think, nor does Sam, that Nessie is a prehistoric monster like a plesiosaur, but it could be a giant eel or a sturgeon. And that is what may be in the photograph in that fin shape. Sam is very excited with a healthy level of skepticism. Sam has been obsessed about the Loch Ness Monster. So we came to Scotland to see Nessie. Sam wanted to attach it to the boat and take it back. He even brought his own ropes. Oh, you got to like a kid that's got goals, Tim. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to grab it, rope it, and drag it back. (laughs) So when we came to Scotland to see Nessie, Sam wanted to attach it to the boat and take it back. What is in the photograph is part of the enduring mystery, part of the legend, part of the magic. Sam would like to come back and get another look. Gary Campbell, the recorder and keeper of the official Loch Ness Monster Sightings Register, said the sighting had been accepted as the eighth of Nessie this year. This is the most we've had this century, he said. That's kind of weird, don't you think? Very much so, Only yes. eight in a year, and that's the most you've ever had? Yeah. 365 days, and if there's a uh, leap, Tim, it's 366 days in a year, and only mm-hmm. eight sightings. Hmm. That's not a lot. We had some debate if the night's sighting was a wave or possibly an animal. After a lot of discussion, we were split 50-50, but on that basis, we have given the benefit of the doubt to it being accepted as, as an official sighting. It certainly is very interesting and raises many questions. In recent years, the most sightings in a year we had is 17, and that was back in 1996. Before that, in the 1960s and 30s were the times that had the most sightings, sometimes more than 20 in a year. Previously, newlywed Rebecca Stewart was touring with her husband Paul on October 2nd when she became the seventh person to spot Nessie this year. Mrs. Stewart was from Chatterton, Oldham, Lancashire, and uh, photographed and saw a large fin shape for five minutes. Her husband also saw the creature, which gate-crashed their honeymoon. Mr. Campbell said, 2017 was a fantastic year for Nessie sightings. This year is turning out to be a vintage one for Nessie, and we have a few more weeks left for any sightings. After fears fell that the world's most famous monster had gone missing, the first official sighting of Nessie this year was logged on April 28th to the relief of her worldwide fans. The last previous sighting was August 21st, 2016. Mr. Campbell stressed that the majority of claimed sightings do not get included on the register, as most can end up being explained. Anything that is later proved to be a hoax or can be subsequently explained is removed from the register, said Mr. Campbell, 51, a chartered account accountant from Inverness. It was 1996 when Mr. Campbell saw something resembling a mini whale with a black shiny back at the south end of the loch. I've spent the last 21 years trying to explain it, admitted Mr. Campbell. Like most sightings, I only saw it for a few seconds. When I went to record it, I found there was no register. So I started one. The following May, since then, Mr. Campbell has logged over 1,080 sightings. According to Google, there were around 200,000 searches each month for the Loch Ness Monster, around 120,000 for information and accommodation close to Loch Ness. The monster mystery is said to be worth 30 million pounds to the region, Tim. Wow. You know what that equals in American money? Um, Trillion dollars. A tri- 40 tri- trillion? Tr- 40 trillion, yeah. 50 trillion? R- loosely, roughly. S- 60? I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 40 to 50 trillion. Okay. Yeah, yeah, just this shy of a gabillion. Wow. Irish missionary St. Columba is first said to have encountered the beast in the River Ness in 565 A.D. 
Among the most famous claimed sightings is a photograph taken in 1934 by Colonel Robert Kenneth Wilson. The image was later exposed as a hoax by one of the participants, Chris Sperling, who on his deathbed revealed that the pictures were staged. And that's the famous black and white photograph you see with the head coming out of the water. Mm -hmm. The Home Office recently rejected a cheeky bid by a group of artists from Glasgow to grant the Loch Ness Monster permanent UK resident after Brexit. And a scientist has revealed his plans to DNA test the waters of Loch Ness in another bid to determine once and for all if Nessie exists. Professor Neil Gemmel will look for traces of unusual DNA by gathering water samples from the Scottish Loch before analyzing them using police forensic techniques. Professor Gemmel of New Zealand's University of Otago thinks this could solve the monster mystery. That's a huge body of water. Yeah, it is. Wouldn't you? I mean, you would think you'd have to have a pretty concentrated level, and that country gets a lot of rain and moisture. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe I'm sounding too skeptical for my own good. Is it just when you read the news, does it make you a bigger skeptic? Is that the problem, Tim? That that is, yeah. It it, it turns out the more words you read, the mm -hmm. more you you mis or disbelieve in in everything that you read. Um, <laughs> it's it's a constant cycle that that that. Uh, we call frowners disease, Dave. Um, <laughs> frowners yeah. disease, really? That's yeah, the yeah, legal actually, name for it. Yeah, I actually saw a doctor at the University of Minnesota about it uh, last week. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, you yeah. know, whatever works for you, man. Yeah. <laughs> Is it? Uh, did they give you a cream or something to clear it up? Uh, no, they, they, uh, actually, um, I got uh, a couple of placebos, and they told me to stay away from the haters on the internet for two weeks, and, and they wow. said I would become bright and sunny. Good luck uh, with yeah. that. Yeah. All right. Uh, speaking of doctors, Tim. Yeah. Futurama seems to have foretold our, our future, Tim. Hence the term Futurama, I guess. Well, well. The world's first human head transplant has been successfully carried out on a corpse. I saw that. Now all he has to do is try it on a live person. The world's first human head transplant has been carried out on a corpse in China, according to Italian professor Sergio Canavero. During an 18-hour operation, experts demonstrated that it is possible to successfully reconnect the spine, nerves, and blood vessels of a severed head. A similar operation on a live human will take place imminently, the controversial professor uh, proclaims. The professor, uh, Canavero, director of the Turin Advanced Neuromodulation Group, made the announcement at a press conference in Vienna this morning. Uh, this was from a few days ago. The procedure was carried out by a team led by Dr. Jiangping Ren, who last year grafted the head onto the body of a monkey. Tim, this is your worst nightmare. Oh, a I human want to head on the body of a monkey? Yeah. With a human head? Yeah. Really? Best of both worlds, Dave. Hmm, I don't know. A full report on the Harbin Medical University team's procedure and a time frame for the live transplant are expected now within the next few days. Speaking at a press conference, Professor Canavero said, For too long, nature has dictated her rules to us. Oh, the folly of mankind, Tim. <laughs> We're born, we grow, we age, we die. For millions of years, humans have evolved, and 110 billion humans have died in the process. That's genocide on a mass scale. No, 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 no it's nature. Yeah, I don't think that's yeah. genocide. No. Unless you just consider that the human body is trying to kill us from the minute we're born. Yeah. Well. All right, I don't know. This will change everything. It will change you at every level. The first human head transplant in the human mode has been realized. The surgery lasted 18 hours. The paper will be released. Everyone said it was impossible, but the surgery was successful. Professor Canavero added that the team's next step is to perform a full head swap between brain-dead organ donors. Now, now that, yeah. Go ahead. Now, okay, so I figured out why the Italian team the first time around. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing, Dave. I, I don't. I, I know you go to a few Italian restaurants. I do. And you have been in your day. Oh. Now, I know you've always... I'm going to Sammy Perella's for my birthday. Love right. that place. Right. Now, here's the deal. You always finish off the meal with what? A, a little vino. Or, or a nice dessert, right? Oh, yes. A little tiramisu, Tim. I do love me some tiramisu. Or a nice Italian ice. So here's the deal, Dave. An Italian ice? What am I, eight years old? 
No, no, an Italian ice. It's always a nice way to, to finish it off. So here's what you do. You take the frozen okay. corpse, and we all know that's made out of ice, mm -hmm. and you get a nice Italian guy, and you put them together, and somehow they can sculpt a, a, no. you know, a human head on no. the body, and they can make no. that whole thing come together. No. Okay, so we can reattach a human head, mm -hmm. reconnect it to the spinal cord, reattach all the blood and nerves. Why can't we do that for spinal cord injury patients? Um. Hmm? 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 Just asking a question. Hmm? Well, because that's a, a live person and they didn't do it on a live person? Well, yeah, but that's my point is, I mean, if you're doing it, and I'm sure they're able to run through and see if the nerve endings are working if they stimulate them, right, after the connection. I don't know. Ask whether the eventual plans for live procedures would go worldwide after initial tests in China. Professor Canavero said, given the amount of mean criticism we receive, I don't think we should go international. For instance, if you stick to the Frankenstein shtick, which doesn't make any sense, then no. This is a medical condition for people who are suffering awfully, so it isn't a joke. Response from the medical community to news of the procedure has been wholly critical. Many professionals have branded the experiment as having negligible scientific or medical and have questioned Professor Canavero's ethics. Dr. James Fildes, NHS Principal Research Scientist at the University Hospital of South Manchester's Transplant Center, said, unless Canavero or Wren provide real evidence that they can perform a head or, more appropriately, a whole body transplant, which is really what it is, right? You're just transplanting an entire body under the part that's still alive, right. on a large animal that recovers sufficient function to improve quality of life, this entire project is morally wrong. How do you feel about that? I mean, Tim, if you were... And I know this is hard to say, and I don't want to, you know, I probably shouldn't even pose the question because we, we wouldn't hopefully never be in the situation. But if you were paralyzed from the neck down and you could at some point remove your head and have it put onto the body of a healthy young person who maybe died of an aneurysm and be given kind of a new lease on life with your head on the body of someone else, would you really want to do that? I, I, well, again, the... the I think what they're arguing is that the the process in which they figure out how to how to scientifically do that is ethically and morally wrong. But if they were to figure out that process, mm -hmm. um, what what part makes it morally wrong? If the donor donates and the person with the affliction wants it to happen, that removes the moral clause. If you are well, willing to do this, and, and they've, we've transplanted fingers and toes before, we've transplanted corneas and livers and kidneys and lungs and hearts, why is this it, any different? I, it, there, there's a little bit more, I think, to it than that, and, and, and the context of which I don't know that we get into in this show, but but uh, and, and there's minutia in there that have to do with individuals and rights and laws and, and things like that, and, and experimentation that that – allows you to do that sort of thing. Um, but it, would I would I be interested in that if I were paralyzed? You know what? I, I think if, you know, we, we've talked about stem cell research mm -hmm. before in the past. Um, it's funny how the stem cell debate has quelled a bit in the last few years. It's not as controversial as it seemed like it was at one time. Um, however, it is still... Somewhat controversial. I won't totally, you know, I won't totally throw away the controversy. It is controversial to some people. Um, however, there was not as much controversy in stem cells as there once was. So, and, and you know what, Corvus Nocturnum and I had this conversation uh, when it came to um, science and what things were scientifically acceptable 50, 60 years ago and what they are as opposed to now. And how we, the things that were brut brutal and considered brutality as opposed to scientific 50, 60 years ago are now, you know, are, are now considered brutality now, but back then were considered science. Um, I think you can say the opposite is true in some, in some procedures. There are some procedures we look at now and think, well, that's just science. But if you were to look at it, from fresh eyes even 40, 50 years ago, if we were to tell you in the 1970s, oh, yeah, we could probably take somebody's head and put it on somebody's body, or we could take your head, Dave, and put it on a monkey's body, you would be Ooh, I choose Davy Jones. 
Well, not that monkey. I mean, I mean, oh. like an actual, you know, Damn. primate. Um, you, you would probably look at me in horror and think, well, that why would you ever want to do that? But now, you know, when we think of the possibilities, the fact that we can do it and it's closer to reality, you think, well, you know what? Let's not get carried away with the with the emotions here. Let's think a little more logically, because you could extend somebody's life. You could do this. You could do that. And let's take some of the emotion out of it and let's put some practicality into it. And all of a sudden, what seems like was not logical 30 years ago might be logical now. So circumstances come into play. Um, so would I? To, this is the long answer becoming even longer. I would consider it. To be honest with you, I would. If I would they told you tomorrow, it. listen, if I said tomorrow I could reattach a whole new leg, a whole new knee down leg for you. Mm-hmm. From a dead person, would you take that? I would ser- seriously consider it. Yes. See, because that, I, wouldn't that, I see the idea of having? Well, first of all, it, to me, it's strange to think you've got one part of you. Okay, in inside, but, but inside, I could maybe understand like a liver, heart, lung transplant. But the but, exterior uh, that's visual to you in, is so strange to me. I don't know that I could handle that. I don't know that I could look down and see somebody else's appendage. But let me let me explain something to you. And you gave a great example, my leg, and I'll, I'll right. give you I'll give you the feeling and let you know why I would seriously consider it. Maybe even do it, and I might I might not even think twice. Because right now, with my right leg and my right foot, I and to explain neuropathy to somebody, I don't have any feeling below my knee. I don't have any feeling. I don't feel like there's anything there, anyways. And then it constantly breaks down on me. There, there's constantly if you can imagine, for the last two years, I've been dealing with infection, constant breaks, I mean, constant fractures. I went back into acute charco two months ago where I continued to have breaks and fractures in my foot. So I've had constant issues with this leg, with this foot. It's faulty. So you're saying to me, well, it would be so strange, it would be so foreign. I feel like I don't have my own leg on me right now anyways. It's not reliable. So... When right, but the visual, we, but the visualization of seeing a different leg that wouldn't. I see that. I understand but, where you're going from because you're dealing. That's why I said it'd be hard no, no, as it, a, as a paralyzed person to say, you know, I don't think I could do this because I don't but, have that issue. But here's the other part of it. Mm-hmm. The other part of it is this: this leg, this foot I have, is two and a half inches shorter than my than my other leg. Mm. So that also creates back problems. It creates neck problems. It creates. Uh, disc herniations. It creates more problems for me. I have 13 herniated discs in my neck and back, and a lot of it is is a result of this leg and won't go away as a result of this leg. Um, so what, you know, so you're right, saying and I, me, I get all that, I, and I do, I grasp but, that can, concept. Well, no, 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 and, and let me finish, let me finish. So with that, you're saying you're going to give me a leg that has the exact same length, it may not look the same as the other leg, okay, but it's going to have complete function. It's going to be mine. It'll have feeling. It'll have strength, and I can walk with it, and it's not going to break down the way the other one did. Yeah, I'm going to consider it because it's going to give me my life back. And the one thing I and, – and another thing, I can never run again on this leg. I can never – um, I can never do the things I wanted to do. I can barely walk on this on this foot as it is right now or barely have the hope to walk on it again. But if you give me that new leg, walking's not going to be an issue. Running's not going to be an issue. I'm not going to have knee issues either. So yeah, you know what? Yeah. I definitely put me in put me in the game. Fascinating. That's that's well, you know, and who knows? Maybe that's where we'll be in a few years where they're able to do that. I don't know. Are they doing full appendage i know they've done finger and toe transplants like outside appendages i don't know if they've ever done full i don't think they well, are i think no. you know what i think they have done a few hand transplants yeah hand thing. they have yeah right but, but i don't but know if they've done like, like a full that. thing like a leg no uh-uh, no and i know a a, a guy maybe that, it's just uh, my ocd i i just think that i i think looking at something somebody else's appendage on my body would just weird me the hell out you know, until I think until you've been in a position where your body doesn't work anymore mm. or that that thing doesn't work anymore the way it should and it's almost dead weight and it's detrimental or it's actually threatened your life and it feels foreign to you already. 
Yeah. You don't consider another alternative. Yeah, I guess now, that's that's a different perspective on it. It's it's weird though. The the other thing too is is people people are so quick to go, oh, just lop it off and throw a prosthetic on there. What would people don't realize is prosthetics don't fit properly. They never do. And and they cause ulcerations, they cause wounds. Um a lot of times they they they're more detrimental than they are helpful. And so to say just lop it off and throw on a prosthetic, you're speaking from a place you don't know. So to say that you could do a transplant that would fit seamlessly, that would interact with your own, even bionics if they were to fit seamlessly and, and wouldn't have that, that risk would be a step up and something to consider. So, you know, prosthetics aren't the answer. Um, so don't don't email and say prosthetics are the answer. They're not. You don't know. You've never been there. Um, especially people who are able-bodied and say just prosthetics. You don't know. Um, I have plenty of people who have who have said uh, who who have prosthetics who have written me and said, "For God's sakes, Tim, do whatever you can to keep your leg." They all say that. Not, not one person has said to me who has a prosthetic. Just lop it off and go with a prosthetic. Right. Well, yeah, it's Not all the able bodies that, that are real easy yeah. to jump to that because it's something yeah. they haven't had to right. to exactly. consider. Yeah, that's brutal. Yeah. It's brutal, man. I, I you know, and of course we all keep you in our thoughts and prayers and all the the crazy things you're having to go through. So uh yeah, it's it there's big changes, man. The world is is evolving and revolving around us and you know, whether it's head transplants or not, and I guess they're going to do this. Uh, there was a Russian guy who was ready to do this a few years ago, um, Mr. Spirdinov, who's 31, and I guess his body is basically, his muscles are, like, deteriorating. So he is like, yeah, let's do it. Worst case scenario, I'm gone. I don't have this pain and problem anymore. But here's a, here's the other thing, too. When mm-hmm. you think from a, from you think, uh, think from a spiritual side of things, does does your soul, do you believe your soul, or even your whole soul, transfer right. over with you from the head to that new body? I or mean, or where does the soul reside? If you take the head and the right. consciousness and add it to the body, are you right. now a joint soul? Right, exactly. Yeah. That's going to be crazy. Do you have a fractured soul when you go to that new body? Do you take your entire soul with you? And is there still a remaining soul in that body that you use? Uh, you know that there's there's that I think that's that might be it, although that's not the overwhelming ethical issue here when when you talk about ethical and moral issues here you have to consider that this was once somebody else's shell and there might be some remnant still in that shell yeah right you know yeah ooh that's I mean bizarre. you know and and just real quickly I know. You've dealt with uh, relatives who have had heart issues. I've dealt with el- relatives that have heart issues. When you get a transplant, we hear transplant stories all the time. Somebody who gets a transplanted organ, they talk about craving things that the the transplant um, or the donor person had craved at one time, or memories that they had, or something like that. It's not like you received a you receive a donor gift that doesn't have memories that come along with it, or have right. a, a piece of that person that comes along with it. Imagine if you get an entire body from somebody. You know, it's I don't think it's impossible to shut out what was what what came with that body. I agree. Very you know? strange. Very strange stuff. Uh, hey, l- let's make this quick mention. You know, we had um, Potsy Weber on our show, right? Anson Williams a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And we uh, talked to him about his alert drops, which are saving lives. And we recommended him. I'll tell you. I, and I said, do me a favor. If you purchase the alert drops, you know, first of all, buy them from our deal over at darknessradio.com and click on the killer deals link. It'll take you to our Amazon page. And all the purchases that you make through there, a small portion goes back to us to help us with all our administrative costs. Over 150 people responded. I said, if you buy it, Take a photograph of it or a copy of your receipt to show me that you made the purchase and email them to me that I would do a drawing. And one lucky winner would get a Darkness Radio prize pack. We have a winner, Tim. Out of the 100 plus, our winner is Libby Pelham. Libby, you are the winner. Congratulations. Your name was drawn at random. I contacted Anson Williams. I told him how many people we had. I told him to give me a number. He gave me a number. Yours was drawn. Congratulations. I will be sending you an email. And um, 
please make sure you respond to it and give me your address so that we can get back to you and get you our uh, little Darkness Radio fun pack. I think you'll enjoy it. There's some books and DVDs and some cool stuff in there. Thank you very much for listening. That's what you got to do, Tim. Yeah. Saving lives, man. That is so cool. People are trying the alert drops, and I've been getting great responses from people that, that tried them. And we're not getting a penny for that, I promise you. At this point, they are not sponsors of ours. I right. just thought it was so important with our listeners, the ghost hunters, the truck drivers, the Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, all these people that are out there listening to our show while they're on the road, this could save some lives. So I'm glad that people took advantage of this. Libby, congratulations. And thank you for reaching out to us and letting us know. Please let us know how you like the, the sh- um, spray, how you guys like the alert drops. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see. All right. Uh, a ghost hunter claims he has some eerie footage, Tim. Eerie footage. He claims to have caught footage of the white-faced, ghoulish figure of a man hanged in one of the U.K.'s most haunted jails for murdering his young lover who dumped him more than 100 years ago. Tony hmm. Ferguson, 32, and his wife, Bev, age 50, were investigating Bodmin Jail, Cornwall, on a Monday evening when they set down their camera for a moment not far from the execution pit. Without realizing it, they had positioned the camera in just the right spot to capture a real haunting as a ghostly figure stalked past the end of the corridor when they weren't looking. Creepy, Tim. It is creepy looking. That is weird. It almost looks like this kind of cloaked figure with a white face. Eerie footage has been seen, which Tony claims is inexplicable, and he's confident it was a ghost. It shows a white-faced figure dressed in a black outfit wander past while turning its head to the side to look toward the camera. Only moments before, Tony had called out the name of William from a plaque, and the investigator believes that the figure could be the ghost of William Hampton, the last man to be hanged in the jail in 1909. Tony from Southampton said, It was insane. I've investigated many locations and seen many things, but ain't never seen activity like this. I can't explain it. (laughs) He was a sailor? (laughs) Yeah. It really shocked me. And that doesn't normally happen. I don't know. I I think I'm going Australian on this bit. I I got nothing. I don't normally get freaked out. I guess my only English accents are going to be really bad Cockney or the extremely snarky. But I always try to remain skeptical about what I witness and try to debunk whatever I capture. That way, I ensure that it's real, as there's possibly a normal explanation. But I think this is a real haunting. There are lots of residual spirits trapped in the jail. Lots have seen this ghost in person around the place. He doesn't acknowledge who see him, which makes me think he's just a residual haunting trapped here. Now, I'm pretty sure looking at the picture of this guy, he he speaks nothing like this, Tim. And I feel like he might have... Stopped for tea like five or six times during that entire investigation. <laughs> it was just by chance that we had to put the camera down and capture the moment he walked through. We weren't <laughs> able to debunk anything when we went back the next night. That's what was so shocking. Tony is adamant that there was no one in the jail while they were there, so he's convinced that what he caught on camera was a real ghost, Tim. After oh, revisit- no. yeah, After revisiting the jail on Tuesday... Uh, the and asking the staff to check CCTV to ensure no one else came into the corridor, he claims the footage cannot be debunked. Tony said the place was so active when we were there, we went back the next day to try to debunk it, like I always do. When I went back there on a Tuesday night, there was a different feel to the place. It's as if I built up a story of the location and built a relationship with it. Spirits Uh learn how you work and how you learn how they work. But they were even more active on Tuesday. I felt dizzy. Like they were with me right there, right now. It was very atmospheric. But there was (laughs) no one there at all who could have walked past. We can't walk around people, so we had to the place to ourselves completely, Tim. Staff Mm -hmm. check the CCTV in the area. Now, where the figure was spotted, and they were shocked to see no one came in there. Not at all. (laughs) Believe it or not, I didn't see it that night. I saw it in the morning when I started editing editing it. I thought, what's that? When I saw it, I was shocked by it. Since Bodmin Jail was built in 1779, there were 55 executions carried out there. Most of them took place, Tim, in the execution pit. Where William was hanged. Well, that would be the place to kill somebody. Some place it's called no. the execution pit. Yeah, you know, you don't do it in the kitchen. No, no, I do it. 
if I get the chance. William, 24, had been convicted of the murder of his 16-year-old girlfriend, Emily, after she tried to end their relationship. Henry Pierpoint was the young man's executioner who was father to Albert Pierpoint, the UK's most famous hangman, who was thought to have hanged 435 people. Tony said, William's name came up when I was reading the plaques on the wall of the jail. When I read his name out, a few orbs came out, and the atmosphere changed him. There were orbs, I tell you, orbs. The lights, they began to dance about on their own. Mm -hmm. Even the technician on duty that day didn't know what had happened as the lights stayed on upstairs, so they couldn't explain. They said nothing appeared wrong, and they didn't know why the lights had suddenly gone off where we were. We showed the people who worked there the footage, and they were shell-shocked by it. Shell-shocked him. By orbs. They claimed that the activity had been quite quiet lately. We're going to do some research into William, but what happened to us certainly matches up to things that others have experienced there, too. Rather than a chance encounter, Tony believes that in order to catch an apparition like this, it's all about developing a relationship with the location and the spirits that haunt it. So you know what you need, Tim? You need some first leaf wine to Uh build up a really good relationship with the location. Do you pour a little Uh, bit on the floor for your homies who aren't there anymore? I do, yeah. I pour a little out, yeah. You know, I I find when you try to develop a a relationship with the location, generally Mm -hmm. the cops come by and they put you in the back of a car. Yeah, well, that's you're you're out dry humping like a... uh, uh, one of those uh, pipes off the side where water comes to him. You're not supposed to do that. That's not the kind of relationship. Work your way up to that, son. Well, if you try to drill the side of a wall, you need, like, <laughs> something to cushion the blow, you know? I mean, I, you might as well go for a pipe with water. At least that way you save yourself a little. Hey, Tim, I have some good news for you. <laughs> According uh-huh. to Time Magazine, you don't <laughs> have to be dumb to believe conspiracy theories. So, Tim, you're off the hook. <laughs> Millions of Americans believe in conspiracy theories, including plenty of people who you might expect would be smart enough to know better. Despite mm-hmm. mountains of scientific ev- uh, <laughs> words is hard. Despite mountains of scientific evidence to the contrary, at least twenty percent of Americans still believe in a link between vaccines and autism, and at least thirty-seven think global warming is a hoax. According to a 2015 analysis, even more of us accept the existence of the paranormal. Forty-two percent believe in ghosts. in extrasensory perception, and those numbers are stable. A 2014 study by conspiracy experts Joseph Usinski of the University of Miami, Miami, (laughs) Miami, that that there University of Miami, Tim, and Joseph Parent of Notre Dame University surveyed 100,000 letters sent to the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune from 1890 to 2010 and found that the percentage that argued for one conspiracy theory or another had barely budged over time. Now, a study published online in the journal Personality and Individual Differences provides new insights into why so many of us believe in things that aren't true. In some cases, we simply just want to believe. In the first part of a two-part study, psychologists Thomas Stahl of the University of Illinois Chicago and Jan Willem van Pugin of the Vigier Universität Amsterdam recruited 343 people online and had them complete surveys related to the so-called importance of rationality scale, the IRS, and the morality of rationality scale, the MRS. In the IRS test, they were asked to agree on a scale of 1 to 7 with a series of statements such as, it is important for me to personally be skeptical about claims that are not backed up by evidence. Now, for the MRS, the survey included statements like, Being skeptical about claims that are not backed up by the evidence is a moral virtue. The people were also asked a number of questions designed to measure their analytic cognitive style, their ACS, which was basically looks for how much they base conclusions on the presence of facts as opposed to an intuitive leaps. Finally, the investigators asked the same participants to rate their beliefs on a scale of one to seven In uh, several familiar conspiracy theories, the moon landings were faked, the government had advance warning of 9-11, and in a broader conspiracy statement such as, there are secret organizations that greatly influence political decisions, belief in six different paranormal phenomena, including reincarnation and astrology, were measured the same way. The second study was similar, but also sought to correlate belief in conspiracy theories and the paranormal with overall cognitive ability. To determine this, the people answered a number of questions that measured their numeracy, or basic mathematical skills, and their language abilities. Oh, I would fail that miserably, Tim. 
<laughs> fail it miserably. Both studies pointed in more or less the same direction. High scores in cognitive styles, the ACS, were associated with low scores in conspiracy or paranormal beliefs. No surprise since those participants rely on hard facts before reaching a conclusion. But the AC, a, uh, ACS itself wasn't enough. People also had to score high in the importance of rational thought, suggesting that not only did they think rationally, but that they considered that fact an important personal quality. The MRS, the measure of rationality as a moral good, had less impact here. A likely explanation, the researchers wrote, is that the MRS primarily predicts social judgments and behaviors, but not privately held beliefs. In the second study, cognitive ability did seem to play a role in making belief in the paranormal less likely, but only among people who also scored on analytic style. The second study's findings regarding conspiracy theor- uh, theories were less conclusive. What's more troubling and just a little mystifying is the fact that so many people in the studies score high on all the rational and intellectual metrics, and yet nonetheless subscribe to disproven theories. That's the case in the real world, too where highly educated people traffic in conspiratorial nonsense that you'd think they'd reject. In these cases, the study concluded the reason may simply be that they're invested emotionally, ideologically, in believing the conspiracies, and they use their considerable cognitive skills to persuade themselves that what's untrue is actually true. If you want to believe vaccines are dangerous or that political party to which you don't belong is plotting the ruination of America, you'll build yourself a credible case. There's a lesson here for us all. It's not enough just to have the ability to think analytically, but the inclination to do so. A little more cold, rational thought may not only help us free ourselves from the silliness of conspiracies, but open us to new ideas. It seems that uh, by that statement right there, they may not have um, really kept their journalistic integrity, Tim. Maybe not. A little more cold, rational thought may not only help us free ourselves from the silliness of conspiracies, but open us to new ideas. I think they might have gone in with their own preconceived notions and just found the numbers that they needed to to back up or verify their thoughts on this. You always have to give conspiracy theories a little bit of credence because there is such a thing as true conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. Had there not been, you never would have gotten Watergate. That's true. All right, here we go, Tim. Speaking of conspiracy theories and political leanings, by day, he was a clerk to a federal judge, a Harvard Law School graduate at the start of his career. By night, he was a ghost hunter and a devotee of the macabre. Brett Joseph Talley is now President Trump's nominee for a lifetime appointment to the federal bench of a U.S. District Court in Ele- or judge in Alabama. Few in memory have been nominated with credentials quite like those of Tally, age 36, an Alabama native, a political speechwriter, an author of horror books, and a fledgling lawyer who's never tried a case. In 2009 and 10, he was a member of the Tuscaloosa Paranormal Research Group, a volunteer operation that since the early 2000s has held all-night visuals and used infrared cameras, handheld sensors, and other devices to search for spectral entities in plantation mansions, abandoned hospitals, and other buildings. He was a real help. He was quiet and real smart, David Higdon of the group's uh, founder and leader told the Washington Post. We try to do everything scientific. Tally did not respond to requests for this interview. In 2014, he was a speechwriter on Capitol Hill. Tally took a post reporter ghost hunting in a district cemetery. As he paused at graves, Tally said he was always maintained a level of skepticism during the paranormal outings. I tend to believe there's a good scientific explanation for weird things people see and hear, Tally said at the time. But I'm open to the idea, and it sure is fun. Tally's nomination has been received with some skepticism of its own. In recent days, he's drawn heat from multiple Democrats in Congress for failing to disclose in a Senate questionnaire that his wife, Ann Donaldson, is chief of staff to the White House counsel. Critics said her position could present a conflict if issues related to the White House were to go before the district court. So there is a conspiracy in this story, Tim. (laughs) Which is? Well, that, you know, his wife is in there poking and prodding and getting the job for him. Last week, an American Bar Association Review Committee gave him a rare not qualified rating because of his lack of legal experience. Yeah, if you've never tried a case, should you be appointed as a lifelong judge? No, no. He's one of four. Although, I, I, I will say this. Maybe that does need to happen. Maybe a judge needs to not be so jaded from all the cases he's seen. And I'm not trying to get into the political rhetoric here, but I've I've been before judges. 
And uh, and I've talked to some judges, and some of them have just been so burned out by their careers that I just wonder if they're really the best ones to make these calls nowadays. I don't know if it's a, a bad idea to try it. And I understand, again, I'm not siding with with Trump's decision one way or another on this. I'm just curious if do we start relooking at the way things go. There are a lot of judges who got into power simply because of cases they've worked on in the past. Should they be judged on different merits? I don't know. Does it make you uncomfortable? I mean, Tim, we're big in the paranormal. Mm -hmm. Do you think I should be judged? If I have a strong political standpoint and something that could lead to making the world a better place, should I be judged because I'm a paranormal radio show host and I've gone ghost hunting and Bigfoot and UFO hunting? Should that weigh in on my abilities as a politico in any way, shape, or form? No. You don't think so? No, not any more than playing on... uh playing on someone's softball team or, or, you know, it's a hobby. It's a hobby like any other hobby, like knitting or, or you know, knitting right, but or the people, softball people team look or at the, like that. People look at the paranormal as though it's uh, kind of an irrational interest. There, there are plenty of irrational interests. And, I, you right. know what, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to piss some people off here, but. Not you. you. Yeah. Yeah. Me. <laughs> you know what? A lot of people give me crap for watching professional wrestling too. And there are a lot of people who have fantasy sports leagues. And, and you know what? There are a lot of people who have things that you can look at and, and question. Right. But, but the fact of the matter is we all have some hobbies that you could go, all right. I don't know that I see any credence in it. Just because you don't see credence in it doesn't mean that it's not, you know, it, it's, if it's something you don't enjoy, that doesn't matter. Or if it's something you don't see much credence in, it doesn't matter. If it's something that somebody enjoys, that's fine. They do that on their own time. What matters when you apply for a position is that you are qualified for that position. I agree. All right, let's do this. We need to take a break. We'll come back. We've got a lot more news stories to cover, a lot more things to talk about. Stay tuned. You're listening to the best in Paranormal Talk Radio. That's Tim. I'm Dave. And this is Beyond the Darkness. Beyond the Darkness. We're back. This is the best in paranormal talk radio. It's supernatural news. We've got a lot of stories to cover, Tim, and I know we're going long already. Maybe we'll share, uh, we'll hold off Parashare this week just because right. there seems to be so much going on in the world of the supernatural and paranormal. It's one of those rare weeks where we've just got a ton of stories to cover. And these, some of these I find really fascinating since we're already kind of on a uh, tear with conspiracy theories. Sure. Have you, have you heard about this new one regarding the moon hoax? The moon hoax. No. Mm-mm. Now, with the moon hoax, what's really interesting to me is we've heard so many different things of in the shields and visors of the astronauts that there have been things reflected like UFOs that were originally released and then they were later digitally edited out, that there were third-party light sources you could see reflected in them that was eventually uh, buffered out. But this one is pretty intriguing. Uh, NASA could have been caught out faking the lunar landings amid claims of a stagehand that can be seen photographed in the reflection of an astronaut's visor who is supposedly on the moon. And this hmm. this does look weird. Now, I don't know if it's some kind of pareidolia, but it certainly looks like somebody else is standing out there. Uh, in this reflection, a conspiracy theory video uploaded on YouTube suggests a human figure not wearing a spacesuit has been captured on camera during the 1972 Apollo 17 landing. Thousands of people have viewed the video uploaded by Ch- uh, Channel Street Cap 1, which has been entitled... Does astronaut's visor reflection show a stagehand on the Apollo fake moon set? The 48th anniversary of Neil Armstrong's first steps on the lunar surface took place in July, but many conspiracy theorists across the globe remain convinced it's the biggest cover-up of all time. Moon hoax conspiracy theorists say desperate President John Kennedy, who wanted to beat the Russians in space race to the moon, ordered the production of a series of films in top-secret studios to make it look like NASA astronauts made it to the lunar surface. Well, wasn't he dead long before they made their first launch? I mean, the, fir- the first group was yeah. Apollo 11, 11 in 1969. He'd been dead for six years at that point. So how did he order the videos, the, the films? 
Well, it, it might have been posthumously, but even so, um, you would think that that would have to. Here's what. Here's the problem I have with that theory. Just quickly, you would have to. You would have to continue that through LBJ and Nixon in order to right. make this conspiracy go. And, right. You know, and I don't see that happening. At the heart of the theory are claims that a radioactive Van Allen belt around Earth would have been lethal to fly through. The video narrator said, I came across this. I have no idea if it's been discovered before or uploaded before. It is from a moon photograph. It is a reflection from one of the astronauts' face visors. So I thought it looked a bit strange. I took a picture of it using my software. What we appear to have here is a figure of a human not wearing a spacesuit, circa early 70s. It is an Apollo 17 photograph. Now, he says that it's somebody not wearing a spacesuit, but i got to be honest with you, Tim. It looks like somebody wearing a spacesuit. Okay. I mean, I, I, I clearly see somebody. It doesn't look like somebody standing there. It looks like somebody in a spacesuit. So I'm not seeing what he's seeing. He looks like the Michelin man to me. Oh, all right. So I think that's it. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. You'll have to take a peek at it as well. He said that he, he had learned that there had been some dispute about the authenticity of the pictures in 2009, but that he had not found the particular picture discussed before or through Google. He added, you can see some sort of, it looks like a man back in the early 1970s, long hair, you know? No, not at all. <laughs> you know You know what it looks more like? Jar Jar Binks. Oh, it doesn't look like long hair. I, if anything, it looks like Jar Jar's big dumb ears hanging down. <laughs> Misa on the moon. <laughs> I, I don't see that it looks like a hippie. <laughs> yeah, man, we're just taking photographs of these guys pretending to walk on the moon. I don't see that. <laughs> He's wearing some sort of, I don't know, waistcoat type thing. One leg there with one shoe, another leg in a shadow of that figure, presumably. I'm going to keep looking through the photographs to see if I can find any other examples. There have been a lot of debate whether these photos were faked. He said that until seeing this picture, he had believed that NASA did make it to the moon. Mm, I'm raising a question about this picture. I, I, I definitely, I will tell you this, I definitely see the reflection, but it just looks like another astronaut. I, I have a real problem. And, you know, when I when I do my conspiracy theory talks, this is one of the conspiracies that we talk about. And right. at times I think to myself, is this a conspiracy that I should pull from the talk because it seems like an outdated conspiracy? And every time I think about pulling it, it comes back up. And it seems to me that that every so often this, this subject comes up because – People seem to want to throw this revision of history in there that, you know what, it, it, and, and here are the, here are the excuses that, that, uh, that we didn't go to the moon. One was that NASA needed the funding. Two was the diversion from the, uh, Vietnam War. Three was that we wanted to beat Russia in the, in the space race. Uh, it could be a new direction for the country at the time, and that Kennedy want, really wanted to uh, get us going by by getting us behind a space race. In that, okay, but he, here's the thing. If, if the Van Allen belts were so dangerous, we've been up and down and, and back and forth many times Allegedly. since. Not, not all the way to the moon, though. <laughs> we haven't made it past the... And I'm, I'm not taking a side here, but I'm just saying I know that the, the mail will come in saying well, we've been up there, but we haven't gone through the Van Allen belt to get to the moon. We've just gone around the Earth. With many different moon missions. And, and supposedly, so have other countries. So, right. with that being said... Have every has every country faked it? Well, if you're um, going to buy into the conspiracy, sure, because no country would want to be would want their people to feel that they're behind. You know, China, Russia, they would they. I could see saying, yes, yes, we've been up there, we've seen this as well, whether they did or not, because they don't want America to seem superior to their people. That would be my guess, and I'm just saying, if you're buying into the conspiratorial angle of the story, I think one of the more fascinating aspects is that uh, Kubrick, before he passed. There's that audio of him talking about filming the super secret deal for the government and basically kind of alluding to the fact that he filmed the moon landing footage. Now, do you believe, as some, this is part of the conspiracy that always fascinates me, do you believe that the footage may have been faked and refilmed because when it was transported back through the Van Allen belt, maybe exposure to the radiation or the... Um, 
flight may have degraded or destroyed the video footage. Now, see, I could buy th- I could buy that a little bit. I, I, I could that some of that footage might have been destroyed. And you might have had to recreate some of it. I could I, I might be able to buy that a little bit if that were even a, a scenario that had to come up. I I could I could get into that. But but here's here's another. I'll throw another monkey wrench in there into why I think the whole every nation could be faking it mm-hmm. thing couldn't come together. And and I know some people might want to try and throw this back in my face. But there's such a thing as the International Space Station. And in order to do that, in order to have nations cooperating with each other, to have technology to put together to put a space station into space that functions between nations, that means that you have to have the technology available to put it up into space to to function and to have multiple space programs that are operational to do this. Now, you could say, well, Tim, it's all being run out of some big – studio somewhere in a different country and it's not really in space come on folks but but listen we don't (laughs) doubt that they've got satellites in orbit tim what uh, the international space system or station is just something that's floating in earth's orbit it hasn't gone through the van allen belt it isn't it's not broken that chasm between here and the moon so i know that that's where the conspiracy theorists are going to go with that aspect is yeah we've got some floating junk up there but we haven't projected or or gone past that point but but to say that every and but what i'm leading to is to say that every nation has not made it to the moon that every nation is faking it is is just ludicrous it it I, it, it hasn't happened and and what i'm saying is to say that that nations are faking their moon landings even us hasn't happened i believe we've landed there i believe we have footage from there and i believe that i, I believe more in the scenario that you just brought up that you know what there might have been some because if you if you've studied uh, photography or, or film at all, you know that there can be you, you can tamper with the old fashioned film mm-hmm. with radiation uh, contamination, with any type of contamination, light contamination, radiation contamination, anything can can spoil that film mm-hmm. when you go to develop it. So yeah, that could have happened, and you, you could have had to you know you. You say to yourself, "Well, we, you know, crap. We don't have anything to to, to show to the American public or to the to the world that we actually did this. What are we going to do?" Well, yeah, you might have to take it to a movie studio and say, "You know what? We have physical evidence. We have moon rocks. We have things we collected from the moon, but we don't have footage." Well, but that's do weird we too. What do you think of that? That most of these gifted moon rocks have been tested, and they're not moon rock. How do we know they're not moon rock? Because they've come out and said, this is not moon rock. We've tested some of these foreign diplomats that we gave moon rocks to, tested it, and it came back. It was like asphalt and weird stuff. I kid you not. Look it up. It's pretty intriguing. You know, and again, I got no skin in the game either way. I'd like to think we made it to the moon, and I'd like to think that we're we're always looking to kind of push past our, our planet and I think, truthfully, that if we did make it to the moon, we probably did encounter aliens up there. That aspect of the story sounds very feasible and plausible to me, that they would be there watching us kind of birth ourselves into the universe. So that doesn't seem so far-fetched for me. But I, And again, like I said, I'm playing devil's advocate, which I know you like to do on most occasions. Oh, sure. I'm just yeah. throwing out some different scenarios on how this looks. But, uh, yeah, there's it's interesting. And why is it illegal to own moon rock? Uh, much for the same reason, it's probably illegal for you to own a nuclear weapon. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there, are, there are certain things that are that could be or are a danger for you to own. Maybe it's got a different type of radioactivity to it. Then why would we give it to foreign diplomats as a gift? You've That's got to the tell me they wouldn't I, touch it? I don't think that you would give actual moon rock to a, a dignitary. I think you, much like you can buy souvenir things from the White House. They, they were pet rocks. The White House. They were pet rocks. Her. Yeah, pet rocks. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, God. I, I don't think you actually give away pieces of the moon to dignitaries. I brought you, you back a piece of Chia Moon. Chia. Exactly. That's exactly right. what it is. Chia it's, Moon to to oh, uh, kind of smooth over the dignitaries. Christmas but, is coming. Get your Chia Moon now. <laughs> exactly. I don't think you give them the real thing, you know. It's kind of like when they water down the drinks at the at the Christmas party. You know, you want to keep the cost down, and you don't want to expose them to the real moonshine. Right. Um, you you, you want know, you want a little bit more conspiracy stuff, Tim? Sure. 
I'm giving a little bit. That was a little Doctor Who, a little Star Trekky in right there because this question posed in this article is proof of time travel. A futuristic man from the future, Tim. <laughs> That's right, a futuristic man from the future, from the year 2028. So what is that? Eleven years from our future is yeah. issuing chilling warnings in a video clip. Tim, a man is claimed to have traveled back more than ten years in time, risking his life to warn humanity about the future. In a shocking video online, in a video broadcast on the YouTube channel Paranormal Elite, Noah, who did not disclose his last name, claims that he risked his life to travel back in time to warn people that the technology exists. The so-called time traveler said, I am not attempting to deceive anyone. My sole objective is to prove to you that time travel exists and that I myself am a time traveler, 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 traveler. Boy, you have some good special effects on the show, Tim. I don't know how you do that. Well, you know, we've expanded the budget. He says, first of all, time travel became possible in the year 2003. It is only used by a top secret organization. The ability to time travel will not be released to the public until 2028. Noah claims that because of his years of time travel, he is suffering from anorexia and depression. He said that he has taken drugs to bring back his youthful looks, but insists that he is 50 years of age. Well, Tim, it's time to admit something. I, too, am a time traveler. I'm 192. Wow. I only only look 50. Huh. Yeah, it's special. I've been having that uh, astro liposuction to keep me younger looking. Wow. That even pisses people off more that think that uh, I've robbed the cradle of love. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. I'll have to talk to you about that uh, after this story. Talk about conspiracy. Oh, I, I saw. Yeah, yeah. Noah added in 2028, the organizations will admit the time travel is real, and then it will be open to the public. In 2021, there will be a really popular device, almost like a Google Glass, that will look like a normal pair of glasses, but will have the processing power to, of today's desktop computers. The problem is that the president of the United States after 2020 election will be Donald Trump. I can say this with 100% certainty. I know many of you will not believe me, but what I say is the truth. Paranormal investigations who research these kinds of phenomena have reportedly sent him 530 pounds. That's $700 American, Tim, to help him adjust to life in 2017. Jeez. (laughs) Big shooters. (laughs) We, the people of 2017, would like to gift you with $700 cash money. To help you adjust to 2017. So that should last him three days. Yeah. Noah finished his broadcast by saying, thank you for listening to me. I wish you all the best future. Goodbye and good luck. Meanwhile, in a document written for the University of Sussex Sussex by astrophysicist John Gribben, co-authored by his wife Mary Gribben, they say there is nothing in the laws of physics to prevent time travel, Tim. It may be extremely difficult to put into practice, but it's not impossible. The research from Mr. and Mrs. Gribben state that two things are required for time travel, an understanding of Albert Einstein's general theory theory of relativity and black holes. The article reads, the possibility of time travel involves those most extreme objects, black holes. And since Einstein's theory is a theory of space and time, It should be no surprise that black holes offer, in principle, a way to travel through space as well as through time. As the distinction between time and space surrounding a black hole becomes almost indistinguishable, experts believe that the mysterious entities could be the key to time travel. What do you think? Time travel. You think it's, do you think it's possible? Do you think it's probable? Hmm. Uh, at this point, no. And I think the guy from 2028 is actually from 2017 and managed what? to get 700 bucks of your money. Well, good luck for him. I mean, hot damn it. If you can pull that off, I have a hard time getting five bucks for a McRib, which doesn't exist in our state. That's what I want to know, Mr. Time Traveler. Yeah. When is the McRib coming to Minnesota? Yeah. Yeah. Sons of bitches. If he's, uh, if he's really from 2028, here are my questions. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Uh, when... When do the Minnesota Vikings finally fold in 2017? Because he should know that. Ouch. It's going to happen, Dave. Ouch. Come on. It's going to happen. It's the Vikings. You, they are not going to go to the Super Bowl Stop in their it. own state. Stop it. Um, Stop it. Don't. Go pee on somebody else's dream, breaker of hearts. 
Number two, uh-huh. um, number two, mm-hmm. like you mentioned, yes. why is the McRib not in Minnesota? Right. I mean, they both start with M. Talk about a conspiracy. Right. What kind of jip is that? Number three. Oh, are we still going? Okay, go on. I'm well, with- I mean, I could rant all day. <laughs> not I mean, you. Really? There's plenty of things this guy should know. Yeah. Um, Time number travel, three. Bastards. Right. Number three, Uh how come there are no good Saturday morning cartoons anymore on Saturday mornings? And when does that thing come back? I don't know. Probably never. we got more things to do, like play video games. But, Tim, fear not. There's still something exciting that you could do if you wanted to visit Glenwood Springs in Colorado. Oh. All right, Tim? Uh Listen, Uh if there's one thing I know about you, it's the fact that you're a man of love. You're a man of affection. Mm-hmm. You're a man of put me in the wild and I will make of it the best that I possibly can. Oh, all the animals would be scared of me. I, I yeah. well, not this one, Tim. Oh, not this one. Mm-hmm. Daryl Whitaker, Tim from Glenwood Springs in Colorado, claims a Sasquatch attacked him and attempted to rape him while he was walking in the woods. Fifty-seven-year-old man was walking to his hunting cabin on Sunday to see if he had, if it had suffered any damage during the winter. All of a sudden, a large gorilla-like creature dropped from a tree in front of him, punched him in the face. It was. A... I'm sorry. It's not funny. It's horrible. Well, it's kind of funny. No, it's not, Tim. Sexual no. assault is not funny <laughs> when it's in the guise of a giant Sasquatch. It was all that camo he was wearing, Dave. Yeah, coming. Yeah, you just look like a sexy, sexy bush. <laughs> that Sasquatch up in the tree going, I got to get me some of that bush. There was at least eight feet tall, and it punches hurt like hell. I was knocked right out at the first blow. <laughs> <laughs> at least he got blown. Oh, uh, yeah. That's the way yeah. to look at it. Yep. While Ms. Whit- Mr. Whitaker was trying to recover from the attack, the large humanoid creature began to tear his clothes while letting out some terrifying howls. Woo! 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 Yeah! Woo, baby! <laughs> That's what it sounded like, Tim. We had that audio directly from the woods. It's good audio. Yeah, when I regained consciousness, he had already torn my pants. Yeah, baby! It was tearing through my underwear. Yeah. Get it! Don't stop. Was get tearing, it, get it. He was tearing through my underwear. I stabbed him in the shoulder. Oh, now he's just bragging. Oh, oh with his yeah. hunting knife. Okay. Oh, uh, right. Well, <laughs> that, that's made a him, of a reach. <laughs> that made him run away. <laughs> Mr. Whitaker immediately reported the attack to both the Glenwood... <laughs> Glenwood Springs Police Department and the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Agency. <laughs> Well, let me and get a, this straight. You and this, buggered by a booger? This is this is the part I believe in most. A joint investigation has been has been launched. I think many joints were smoked before that investigation, Tim. <laughs> well, it, was it is Colorado. Legal, yeah. It was just a big, dirty, angry, aggressive hippie <laughs> who has a thing for men in camo. Investigators found some extremely large footprints on the site, which they believe are those of the aggressor. Daryl Whitaker is convinced that the creature who attacked him was a Sasquatch, but the GSPD investigators say it's more probable that the attacker is simply a particularly a particularly large and hairy man. Well, let's not judge. I mean, you know. <laughs> they're, in, they're currently interrogating nearby residents to see if anyone noticed an individual corresponding to the description. <laughs> All right, so did you see any large, wild, hairy men with an erection running through the woods? <laughs> looking, very, looking very upset to have been stabbed in the shoulder. It's kind of hard to run when you're hard. Oh, you God. Mean? According to the victim, the attacker, the attacker measures around eight feet tall, and it's extremely hairy. <laughs> he has brown hair. Brown dark eyes and extremely, extremely large feet. And you know what they say about extremely large feet, Dave? Big shoes? Yes. If you possess any information concerning the suspect, please contact the Glenwood Springs Police Department or the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Agency. 
I want to hear those reports, Tim. I seen him. I seen he's, him running. He's angry. I seen him running. His compass was pointing north. He's, he's angry and horny as all get out. Oh. All I heard was thump, thump, boom, thump, thump, boom, thump, thump, boom. It's like he had thir- three legs. <laughs> There's something wrong with these people. He, he done seen it, Tim. Dropped out of a tree, punched him upside the head. And took, he wasn't even with his hands. He done took me in the biblical way, Tim. <laughs> and he didn't even offer to buy me no first leaf wine. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Which, by the way, you can get for uh, you can get think three he was, for fifteen. Do you think he was like <laughs> he was large and hairy, and he had uh, know, how do I say it? Uh, big feet. <laughs> do you think that's was he was he being honest about that dissertation? <laughs> uh, maybe maybe that's all he was wanting to see at the time was his feet. Oh know. my god! Yeah. yeah. All right, Tim. I know, I know you're a man. In the eye after that, you know. Like, <laughs> you just don't want did to. you do the walk of shame past all the woodland creatures, <laughs> yes. carrying the, your boots in one hand? The, the squirrels are the worst. Oh, no, they're the ones who chatter oh, and laugh. Oh, and, stop it! I think I have a cracked rib. <laughs> oh God! Like, it's a shut up. There's nothing worse than being mocked by squirrels. On yes. your way home from a night with Sasquatch. <laughs> they throw their nuts at you. It's the second time it happens that oh, night. God. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, <laughs> God. Yeah. All right. Let me uh, let me gather myself here. <laughs> That's what he said. All right. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> a workman spots a headless ghost carrying a baby. <laughs> Well, building a lift shaft. <laughs> in a ch- Is this another big I don't story? know. Oh, no. oh I just, shaft. okay, hold on. While yeah. building a lift shaft in a Georgian house. All right. A bricklayer <laughs> believes he encountered grisly goings on while working in a Georgian house in Bristol. Chris Chalker and college Darren, college, <laughs> that's the English version. <laughs> Chris Chalker and colleague Darren Vowles. We're working on the basement of the property in Portland Square, St. Paul's, when they experienced what they described as paranormal activity, Tim. No. That's right, little Timmy. <laughs> I uh, hate for Sasquatch to see that. Yeah, what, little Timmy? <laughs> yeah. He might shrink up into my stomach. Oh, God. I can't even get the rest of the story done. It won't come on out. <laughs> <laughs> Neither would little Timmy. <laughs> Scared the shit. I, I can't. Uh, I can't read it. It won't come out. <laughs> it, it just won't happen. All right, we're gonna have to skip that story. Let's let's move on to another one. All right. <clears throat> uh, all right. See the black cloud-like image at the right of the screen. Take another look. That's what Ahamad Hamad, a store manager at Skip's Grocery Store in Sansom Park, which is northwest of Fort Worth, said he believes. There was a traveling, uh, was a ghost traveling across the hood of his truck. Hamad said that at exactly 7.37 p.m. on Monday night, he was working in the store alone when the lights above him flickered. It was just like a bad light, Hamad said, but it's my habit to always look at the cameras every five to ten minutes. He said when he glanced at the camera, he saw dark images pass over the hood of his truck. It's a live view. I saw something pass over the top of my truck and go inside the wall like a black cloud, Hamad said. Next, he checked all of the store cameras facing the parking lot. He didn't see anyone or any objects outside. I went outside and it was really quiet, said Hamad. We don't know what it is, actually. This was the first time Hamad has had cameras and caught a glimpse of something seemingly paranormal. His brother decided to post the video on YouTube on Tuesday for any doubters of his story. About a year ago, Hamad dealt with similar issues when motion sensors on the store's alarm were triggered three times. In one night. By something unknown. That's the worst type of thing, Tim, when it's unknown. Yeah. 
Well, yeah. He said on his drive to Arlington, he got an alert from the alarm system a few minutes after midnight. I came back and left, and then after one hour, I had to come back again, said Hamad. An hour later, the third time, it went off again. The police came two times, but the third time, I told them it's not needed. Hamad said he changed the motion sensors, but the problem continued. He described, or he decided to disable the motion sensors that seemingly fixed the problem, but since then, other strange occurrences have happened. He said one night... After the store was closed around midnight, one of the chairs in front of the video poker machine that sits in the corner began swaying from side to side. One night I'm here, and one of those chairs was moving. I'm doing paperwork, and I thought, it was the airflow or something, Hamad said. Most of the time you're busy and not thinking about it, and it was the last thing you need to see happening. He also was told by a former employee that strange things were happening around the store at night. He was telling me... That there's sounds, said Hamad. On Sunday nights, I work almost all day, so sometimes I hear knocking, but I don't pay attention because I think it's just my mind playing tricks on me. Despite what seems to be paranormal activity happening around the store, Hamad said he has no plans to leave, Tim. I didn't believe in this stuff before, but I do believe they exist, Hamad said, but I also believe that they can't hurt you at all. That's good. He's standing up for himself, Tim. Yeah. He's not taking any shit from no spirits, son. <laughs> Meanwhile, in New York, a flat owner claiming to be haunted by a ghost he calls Dear David has shared an image of what he said is a demonic child staring at him in his bedroom. Adam Ellis of New York says he's haunted by the ghost of a dead child who is trying to kill him. The demon child apparently began appearing to him in dreams with a misshapen, shrunken head coming to him whenever he fell asleep. After sharing footage of the supposed hauntings online in August... Adam quickly went viral. Still alive, three months later, he shared his spookiest snap yet of the specter sitting in his bedroom, staring at him. Last time I dreamed about him again, or last night I dreamed about him again, it was almost exactly the same as the first time I saw him, he told the son. The demon child is said to have slithered over to him from his chair while Adam was paralyzed on the bed, unable to move. So trying to prove the evil being was real, he began taking pictures on his phone of the demon. Now, Tim, tell me what's wrong with that statement. Let me give you just a clue. Okay. The demon child is said to have slithered over to him from his chair while Adam was paralyzed on the bed, unable to move. So trying to prove the evil being was real, he began taking pictures on his phone. But he's paralyzed. Dun, dun, dun! I thought, if David's going to kill me, maybe I can at least get evidence on my phone. I started snapping pictures in the dark, he said. The demon is then said to have crawled down off the chair and started shuffling toward him menacingly. Eventually... It was face-to-face -face with him muttering in his ear before writhing away. When Adam woke up, he let out a sign of relief Still, che or until checking his phone and realizing the pictures were real. Chilling snaps appear to show a childlike figure sitting in a chair, staring back at the camera, just as Adam described in his dreams. Adam has been documenting the ghostly activities of Dear David since August. The abnormal phenomenons, which include his cat staring at the door at midnight every night, unmarked calls, and his local coffee shop appearing to mysteriously shut down, have captivated hundreds of thousands of people and left him terrified. After a couple of weeks of silence, Adam came back on Twitter last month to share the latest two scary happenings, claiming that Dear David was back once again to torment him. The cartoonist... Hmm first explained that one of his friends came over to his apartment in order to cleanse the place. While he was receiving offers from many professional mediums and ghost hunting TV shows, Adam said he's declined them all because he wants to avoid sensationalizing what has happened to him. Okay, Tim, mm -hmm. did you hear that part? I, I did, yeah. Yeah, he turned down TV and mediums because right. he doesn't want to sensationalize what's happening to him. Adam then told his yeah. 501,000 followers that for a while things appeared to return to normal after several months of escalating anxiety. So if you're trying to avoid sensationalizing something, why are you posting about it and making a blog about it? <laughs> the cats weren't gathering at the door anymore. 
I stopped having dreams, he wrote. It was starting to seem like it was over. But that all changed when Adam passed an abandoned warehouse on his way to work. Interesting, the, the warehouse has appeared in his Dear David stories before. According to Adam, it used to be a bustling food cart repair depot, but it suddenly became vacant, apparently without any previous warning. After the presumed ghost started haunting his apartment, the cartoonist has also said he once had a dream in which Dear David dragged him around an empty warehouse. Adam said he was walking past the warehouse when he noticed something unusual. This time, all the metal doors were wide open, sunlight pouring in. The warehouse was still mostly empty, except one thing, he wrote. There was a hearse parked near the back wall. The cartoonist shared a photo of the parked hearse that he says was in the empty warehouse. Although he thought the sighting was weird, Adam didn't think much of it until another unusual event unfolded, Tim. Does this, you know, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't like to be cynical about all this stuff. I've had, I don't know if you've had a lot of people come to you with this story. These dear David stories. Um, one or two. Yeah, I've had a couple hundred and I've, I've held off, but the reason I decided to read this is because we are going to weigh in on it here. He says it was around 11 or so and I was watching TV on the couch. I went into the dining room to get a drink from the fridge and noticed both the cats sitting by the far window staring up at it, he wrote. Adam's cats have a history of staring at shapes that he has linked to dear David sightings in the past. The windows look out onto the roof of the business next door. I glanced out the window but didn't see anything. I figured that maybe there was a mouse in the wall or something. I shrugged and grabbed a beer from the fridge. As I went into the kitchen to get the bottle opener, I noticed something. There's a window in the kitchen which looks out onto the same roof, and someone was standing on the roof staring at me. At this point, Adam said he then ducked down immediately, then switched off the light in his room. He then reached into his pocket to take a photo, which he shared on Twitter. The picture, while very dark, does appear to show a shape close to Adam's window. The cartoonist said he tried to make a better photo, but that the silhouette had disappeared by the time he did so. I closed all the blinds and made sure the door was locked and then drank like five more beers until I was too drunk to be scared, he said. But now I feel like I'm back at square one. I'm sure it was him. He's not going away. I don't know what to do. Earlier last month, Adam decided to travel to Japan for two weeks, believing that if he left his apartment long enough, dear David would leave him alone. But apparently the evil spirit has managed to keep tormenting him, even from thousands of miles away. During his last day in Japan, Adam took a walk around the city of Sapporo and ended up in a park, Tim. There, he took photos of a cylindrical statue, which he thought looked interesting. But at one point, Adam said he almost dropped his phone when he spotted a spookily familiar figure. No, Tim, it wasn't an eight-foot erect Bigfoot. <laughs> but one element of the statue looks strikingly similar to the representations of dear David Adam has shared in the past. This version, displayed among other characters in the statue, takes the shape of a baby held in a woman's arms who has the same dented head as dear David. It felt too similar to be a dink. I felt dizzy staring up at it. This kid with a dented head, Adam wrote after the encounter. I don't know. Maybe I'm overreacting. Maybe it's nothing. But it doesn't feel like nothing. Despite the scary occurrence, Adam made it back to New York safely and posted a photo of himself getting reunited with one of his cherished cats. The Dear David saga began in August when Adam posted a very lengthy Twitter thread that began with the blunt claim, so my, my apartment is currently being haunted by the ghost of a dead child, and he's trying to kill me. Hmm. 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 Adam's story began with a series of very vivid dreams featuring a child with a misshapen head sitting in a green rocking chair at the end of his bed while he, the terrifying experiences uh, were happening during sleep paralysis. For a while, he just stared at me. And then he got right out of the chair and started shambling toward the bed. He said, right before he reached my bed, I woke up screaming. A few nights after that horrifying experience, he dreamed of a girl approaching him in a library, telling him that the boy he met was called Dear David. He's dead. He only appears at midnight. And you can ask him two questions. If you said, Dear David, first, Adam claimed, she said, but never try to ask him a third question or he'll kill you. Adam was confronted again with David in his dreams soon after and questioned him about how he died, learning it was an accident in a store that someone pushed a shelf onto his head. He mistakenly asked a third question before waking up petrified. He researched online looking for boys who died in stores in the city, 
but found nothing. Adam eventually moved into a larger apartment upstairs from his own, and months went by without any sight or sign of dear David, until suddenly his cats began acting strangely. For the past four nights, my cats gather at the front door at exactly midnight and just stare at it, almost like something's on the other side, he said in tweets from earlier that month. Last night, I got a weird feeling and looked out at the peephole, and I'm dead certain I saw movement on the other side. He took photos through the peephole, which he shared with the thread, claiming he is certain he saw something moving. He also shared a video of one of his cats staring intently at his front door, meowing. All right. I don't know. I'm not trying to be a cynical prick here, but if you were to ask me, and he's drawn pictures of this character, Mm -hmm. I would say this, Tim. Okay. I would say that this sounds like a viral marketing technique to sell a story to a horror movie company. Mm Mm-hmm. Right? This is in the same vein as Blair Witch. It's in the same vein as um, The Fourth Kind. Remember that movie? Right. Claiming to be a documentary movie that they filmed um, an entertainment version, but they interspliced real documentary footage from Mm -hmm. the actual investigation. Mm -hmm. And then this just feels very viral in nature. And then he's contradicting himself. Oh, I didn't want to draw any sensationalism. Well, no, he didn't want any mediums or ghost hunters who were willing to come in and investigate for free. Right. But I bet that if he needs to sell the story to Hollywood, and maybe I'm wrong. If if I'm wrong, you can email me, Dave at darknessradio.com. If you're listening, sir, we'd love to hear from you. I've I've requested you to be on our show about three or four times and on Coast to Coast AM with no response. Hmm. So, again, if you if you wanted to share it, but you don't want to sensationalize it, Tim, why share it at all? Right. To your 501,000 listeners or followers. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being too cynical on the whole thing. But it no. just seems kind of fakey to me. Yeah, and on top of it, you had the whole three questions, and you know, right. got, this, yeah, this is like a yeah. Bloody Mary candy man kind yep. of thing yep. that he is lo- loading up. And you can ask three questions, or you can ask two questions, and if you ask a third question, he'll kill you. Yeah. Right? Well, wouldn't your second question yeah. have been, why are you haunting me? Or can I get a free third question and nothing happened to me? <laughs> right. <laughs> No. Yeah. Damn. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, that's it for this week, kids. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. We've got some cool stuff to talk about. We do want to thank all of you for listening, hanging in with us. Remember, it's a truncated, shorter week. We'll be here Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We're off Thursday and Friday, but we'll be back next week with another full week of the best in paranormal talk radio. And I alluded to it earlier, Tim. It was funny. Yeah, we, uh, you know, I got married on Saturday. A nice little home deal. Uh, I, I, and I, you know, I've actually taken, uh, crap from listeners because I, you weren't in any of the pictures. And I said, no, 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 you got to understand this literally was her kids and my kids. Mm-hmm. And that was it. We just mm-hmm. got married. Her sister was there to take pictures. And that was the extent of, of who was invited to the, to the deal. We wanted very small. We both been married before. We just wanted our kids around us in our living room, got married here. I post these beautiful pictures of my bride and I very happy day. And people just cannot help themselves from being morons, Tim. <laughs> I mean, I got a lot of outpouring of love, and, and my right. bride and I are very happy with that. We get so much love and support from thousands of listeners around the world, including William Shatner. That's all I'm going to say, Tim. Wow. Um, but the couple of people that have – why would you pop on and be like, why don't you marry somebody your own age? You look like you could be her grandfather. Why would oh. that even cross your mind to post on somebody's page? Why would you oh – Now, first of all, my bride is beautiful, and she looks very young. As a matter of fact, most people mistake her for her early to maybe mid-20s, uh-huh. and she is – much older than that. And that's all I'll say. I don't, uh, it's not my place to put out her age publicly, but we are not that far apart in age. Yes, I'll be 50, and uh, we're around 10 years different in age, around. And that's all I'll tell people. But I, I just think it's ridiculous that people, why would, why, I'm, I'm baffled by that. And I know people are like, well, don't give the trolls or haters any fodder. And when you talk about them, all it does is make them stronger. But I'm just always baffled, you know, in this day and age, just be kind to one another. Be loving to one another. And when you see somebody posting something that makes them joyous and happy, if you are ready to write something, read it back to yourself. And if you think there's any chance that what you're about to push send to could be offensive or rude, 
How about you just erase it and don't write anything? And I don't just mean that to me. I mean, in general, to people on the planet, just be kind to one another. <laughs> we, we live in a weird time, man. It's just you need to be nicer to people. I think it's beyond some people. I think it takes more energy for some people to be nice than it is to be negative. And it's I don't crazy, know why isn't people. It? Yeah, it is creepy. I don't know why people feel the need to to spread that. I don't know. But I I, on behalf of my wife and myself, I want to thank again everybody for your love, support, compassion, and the well wishes because it has been amazing and and just absolutely overwhelming to get all the love and support. And people, Tim, I got to be honest, people have been asking where we're registered. Mm-hmm. And normally I feel weird about that, but you know what? What the hell? I'm going to be 50 years old. You want to know where I'm registered? It's um, it's my bank, and you could just go in and uh, ask for a list of what we're looking for. They're usually in denominations of hundreds, two hundreds, and three hundreds, but whatever you can afford is the best way to go. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, boy. No, I'm just kidding. You, we're not uh, we're not registered at the bank. You could just send the money directly to me at P.O. Box 9847. No, I'm not going to give out a real address. <laughs> it's not safe to have them sent to my house. So just send them to Tim Dennis at 4573 uh-huh. Global uh, Avenue. Uh, 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 what? I don't want people to know my address. Well, where? I can't have them send it to my house, Tim. Anyway, 4873 <laughs> Global <laughs> Avenue. What? They have this, actually, they have this new app. Uh-huh. I think it's called, is, is it Zello? I'm trying to remember. You can Z- I think it it's Zell, email. Z-E-L-L-E, but uh, we're not here to advertise oh, them. Zell. So just send the yeah. money right to Tim at 4873 Global uh, Avenue. Uh, 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 no? no? Use the app. I mean, you can send them an email address. But then it's that means easy. i got to give them my, my checking account so they can put money in, Tim. It would be better if you just brought large handfuls of money. I'll even let, if we can put out your address, Tim, I'll let you keep half of the money. At 4873 Global uh, Avenue. Uh, uh, no? But Dave, no? that means it. People might show up to my house. Well, yeah, that's the object to drop off money for me and my wife. My wife, and I'm going to be fifty, so there should be double the money because I got married and I'm going to have my fiftieth birthday party. So if you want to drop off money, it's four eight seven three Global Avenue. Uh, but, 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 uh, no, Dave, what? What if a naked Sasquatch shows up? Take pictures. That's oh, it for this yeah. <laughs> this day. We'll be back tomorrow. You've been listening to the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness.